Mr. Tory Roberts was originally raised in Watts in Los Angeles. However, he survived the perils of the streets and hails from California State University. He has spent 11 years working in corporate America in the field of technology and marketing. He has since founded One Church of Los Angeles, where he oversees four consecutive services. It has been dubbed one of the fastest growing churches in LA. In addition to One Church, he and his wife, Sarah Jakes Roberts, pastor the Potter's House of Denver. Collectively, he and his lovely wife have six children. Please welcome to the stage, Pastor Torre Roberts. Hallelujah. Good morning, Potter's House Dallas. How we doing? Family, it's, it's so wonderful. It's so wonderful to be here with you today. I bring you greetings from Los Angeles and Denver, and I just believe that God's doing something special. Anybody can already tell that God's going to do something special in this house today? I sense the presence and the glory of the Lord so, so wonderfully. I miss my bishop. <laughs> Typically, when I, when I, when I come to, to the Potter's house, when I come to Dallas on a Sunday, I can sit over there and receive from him. And so, so pray for me. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Nevertheless, I have a word from God. And I spoke to Bishop last night, and, and he said, feed my sheep. I said, yes, sir. I said, yes, sir. Can we give it up and celebrate our bishop right now? <laughs> Love him so much. First Lady Sarita Jakes, come on. How many of us know that that's his rock? His foundation, we honor. She's watching right now, and, and I'm just blessed to, to have my whole family with me. We've been on the road for about three weeks, and of course, my bride, Pastor Sarah, is here today. What's up, girl? And then all of our children are here today. Malachi, Isaiah, Taya, Rin. Let me see, Ella's over there and Mackenzie. Can you help me honor my family? Come on, somebody. How many of us know it's, it's all about family? Family first. And you are my family. And I thank God. I'm, I'm really loving this city. I was driving around yesterday and just moving about. And it just, I just feel the favor of God when I, when I drive through Dallas. And I believe it's because y'all praying. Come on, somebody. Y'all, we, we are praying church. We're a church that's actively engaged. And, in culture and society. And let me just tell you something about you that I just sensed as I was sitting over there preparing and preparing to step up here. You are a strong people. I'm serious. There are world changes in this room. I see some trees in here, some unshakable people. Where are my unshakable people? You've been tried. You have never denied. And you're willing to be tried again. Come on, somebody. Where are my gangsters in God's house? You're not afraid of any devil, any demon, any trouble, any situation, because you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Come on, somebody. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but, but God delivers us out of them all. And we also know that all things work together for good. I was sitting back. And I was just marveling at you as a congregation, as a people, and I felt the strength of God. And I know that type of strength doesn't come easy. And I just wanted to honor that. We need, we need to honor, you know, society oftentimes honors stuff that is nothing. But I celebrate and I honor strong people. And you are strong people. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for being a strong people, for lifting up my father in love and my mother in love and this whole church, which is a global movement. And I'm so grateful for all of you who support, all of you who serve in your various capacities. It's a blessing, and, and the world is being changed as a result of your commitment. Let's go to Psalm chapter 1, the first division of the psalm. And I want to read the first three verses therein. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it reads like this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also 
shall not wither, and whatever he does, shall prosper. God gave me this word for you, and that, that word is just keep walking. Just keep walking. Father, we come before you this morning, first of all, so grateful to be in your glorious house. So grateful to be here in your presence and in your courts, God, with you. You said in your word that the purpose of the gathering is to accommodate three things for us to meet with you, for you to speak to us, and for you to dwell among us. That's what you told Moses when he was building the tabernacle. So God, we thank you for this meeting. You're here. You're sitting in this place right now. And God, we believe you're gonna speak to us. You're gonna speak to every person in this building, every person watching via live stream. I thank you, God. And you're gonna dwell among us, God. We're gonna sit in your presence and we're gonna sit in the reality of your glory so that the end result can be transformation. God, we are here for more than inspiration. We desire transformation. God, I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and insight and knowledge and prophecy and full use of all the gifts of the Holy Spirit to minister this word with clarity and accuracy to the end, God, that it takes root in the hearts and the minds of your sons and daughters, that it will take root and bear fruit. And therefore, and thereby, we will never be the same again. We decree it, we believe it, we accept it, we receive it, we expect it, and it is so in Jesus' name. If you believe that, give God praise like it's already happened. Come on, somebody. Come on, take it right now. Take it in the spirit first. In the spirit first. God bless you. You may be seated. You may be seated. I'm going to put this down because I feel like something might be going on. So we just got off a, off a tour, my wife and I, and we have a ministry called Woman Evolved that my wife founded, and we... we it is empowering women by the thousands all over the world. It is absolutely unprecedented, the grace of God that's on this movement. We are seeing women rise up and take their place in the kingdom and in culture and in society. It is absolutely incredible. And recently, we were able to bring on a sponsor, and that sponsor is Toyota, the, the automaker. And... And if you have never studied the business of Toyota, they are consistently one of the most profitable automakers in the world. They always show up on the top 10 list of, of automakers as it relates to profitability. And, and so we asked them why they decided to partner with Woman Evolve. And one of the things that they said was that Woman Evolve as, as it relates to a movement designed to empower people and to get them to continuously and consistently evolve is similar to a business philosophy that they employ, and that business philosophy is called Kaizen. And Kaizen is a Sino-Japanese term, and it literally means constant and continuous improvement constant and continuous improvement. And so they felt that there was alignment between what this movement, Woman Evolve, was about and what they were trying to do. And, uh, and I employ personally the same philosophy, and I believe that every believer ought to employ that, the same philosophy, that philosophy of constant improvement, because you and I will always be more than what we think. They're, they're, the, the, the best of us is always ahead of us. And that's why we can't be stagnant because the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter one, beginning in verse four, God says, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And not only did I know you, but I set you apart and I ordained you. And so you're more than what you think. And so it is similar 
to what the Apostle Paul was saying when he says, ultimately, in Philippians chapter 3, he says, I have not arrived. He said, I am not perfected. I have not attained. And he was not some new jack in the faith when this took place. He was mature, but even him as a mature person said there's more. And so he says, I'm forgetting those things that are behind, and I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So I believe that every believer has to have that type of attitude. We have to learn how to balance between believing that we are enough in the moment, but yet there's, there's more. Are you tracking with me? I've got to balance that. I can't look down on myself or feel less than myself because I'm not fully myself yet. Oh, I can't wait to get into this. I, I, I'm not mad at me because I'm growing, so I have to balance saying to myself, I'm enough right now, but yet and still there's more because I'm in the process of becoming. I'm on my way to maturity. It, the writer of Hebrews, many believe it was the Apostle Paul, the writer of Hebrews says, now let us run on to perfection. And that word is a Greek word, and it means maturity. So the life of the believer is kaizen. It is constant improvement. I'm not going to stay where I am. No matter how high I am or how low I am, I am after something. Because there's something that God knows about me that I have not fully grasped yet. So I'm forgetting what's behind me and I'm straining to lay hold of what is before me. Paul says something. He says in Philippians 3, in that same place, he says, I am trying to apprehend what I have been apprehended for. In other words, I am trying to grasp what God has grasped me for. Where are my people in God's house and God has grasped you? You are here because he has grasped you and some of you have been grasped out of some tricky situation. You ain't got to say nothing. Don't look at me. Just you and I know it. He reached down and he grasped you. And Paul is saying, I am after what he was after when he touched me. Because God has a narrative about me that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. And it will take me my entire life to figure it out. That's why as long as I've got breath, Kaizen, as long as there's breath in my body, I'm after something. And what I've learned about maturity, as it relates to maturity, what I've learned about maturity is that there is a telltale sign that proves that you truly have become mature. There is this one key marker of true progress, and that is this thing called consistency it's called consistency and as we get into the text I'm going to talk about this certain type of consistency that unlocks a fullness and a fruitfulness that comes from God that very few attain to anybody want to be fruitful Anybody want to have everything that God has for them? I don't know about you, but I am greedy in that way. I want everything that God has predestined and preordained for me. I will be who I need to be. I will pursue what I need to pursue. Oh, come on, somebody. Somebody needs to be hungry and thirsty and desperate for you. What did you see? Family, sometimes I will wake up in the morning and I will look in the mirror and I'll say, God, what did you see when you made me? Because I realized it, and I talked about this in my first book, Purpose Awakening, shameless plug in Jesus' name. But I realized that the only reason why I'm here and the only reason why you are here is because of a brilliant thought that was in God's mind. Ah, feel the Holy Ghost. God's inspiration 
to birth you, to bring you forth, was that there was something incredible in his mind. And it was that motivation that brought you here. Just tell your neighbor, God saw something. He saw something. He saw something. So my life is now spent trying to figure out what he saw. That's maturity. But this, this evidence of, of, of maturity is consistency. If you're taking notes, write this down. Consistency is the evidence of maturity and the pathway to mastery. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Now, some of you got in trouble right there. You're like, wait, wait, hold on. Mastery, what, what are you talking about? No, no, no. We're supposed to go from level to level. Hello, somebody. Now, we won't arrive at perfect mastery until the day of the Lord. That's what the word says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6, excuse me, 1 and 16, being confident in this very thing. He who has begun a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. But it's a very interesting, the tense there is very interesting when it talks about he who has begun a good work shall complete it, that the verb there is present perfect tense, which means that it is both happening and happened. I feel God. It has both happened and is happening. Like salvation, right? We are saved and yet are being saved. Come on, somebody. We, we are made whole, but, but yet being whole from glory to glory. In other words, it happens in the spiritual first, and then we walk out the manifestation of the finished work in the natural. I wish somebody would catch what I'm saying today. Christ has made me whole. Now I, Tore, have to grow up in the wholeness of his Christ identity. That's why when you get saved, you can't quit. Salvation is a beginning, baby, not an ending. Are you tracking with me? Now I have, there's a door that has been opened to me. And now I walk through that door and I find myself from level to level. And I start shaking off some things and things start breaking off for me. And I, I start getting my cough. I'm getting ahead of myself. Consistency is the evidence of maturity and the pathway of mastery. Check this out. The difference between an amateur and a pro is consistency. Hey. Maturity doesn't hit and miss. Can we talk this morning? I'm going to get to the good stuff in just a second, but can I just build here? Maturity doesn't hit and miss. Maturity is demonstrated by how you consistently hit and win. Consistency says, I have become what I used to practice. I've become what, what, what I used to practice. And so even as it relates to, to pros, pros are, are tracked over a period of time. Because I want to see your track record. Life rewards the consistent. Consistency is a rhythm. It's a rhythm. There's a rhythm to life. Look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, real quick. I want to, you got to understand that life is about rhythms and cycles. 822, Genesis says, says, while the earth remains, in other words, forever. Seed time and harvest. That's a rhythm. That's a rhythm. Pastor Dobbins talked about it's harvest time. There's a rhythm. There's a rhythm. There's a rhythm to it, right? While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So life is about rhythms. Life rises and falls because of rhythms. Generational curses and generational blessings can be tied back to a rhythm. To a rhythm. To a rhythm. Productive rhythms and non-productive rhythms. It's funny, I, 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 sometimes I question what people tie to genetics. Because sometimes things are tied to genetics and, and I wonder, and, it's, and I believe it, it's possible, but sometimes I wonder, is it genetics or is it the rhythms? So, so in other words, do I have 
high cholesterol because of genetics or am I in the rhythm of eating? Be, 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 because correlation is not causation. You understand what I'm saying? So, or or, or, or are the rhythms so powerful that they even influence genetics? So life, so can I talk to you today? So life is about rhythms. God set it up that way, winter and summer, day and night. I am where I am, and I experience what I am constantly experiencing because of my rhythms. You might call them the patterns, but for consistency's sake, because of my rhythms. Some people say things never seem to work for me in a certain area, and what you don't realize is that when you say that, what you are doing is you are bowing down to a rhythm. I feel God, but I believe what God's going to do today is God is going to break some unproductive, unhealthy, self-sabotaging rhythms, and he's going to bring you into a state of consistency, and you're going to start producing like never before. If that's your word, take about four seconds and give God a shout in his house. I'm about to be consistent, baby. I'm about to get my life together, baby. I'm about to be mature, baby, because I've got something to birth. There's stuff in me, and I'm not going to let a broken rhythm, and I'm not going to let a false rhythm keep me from bringing forth everything that God put in me before he put me in my mother's womb. I am pregnant with some stuff. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Uh-huh. Pregnant with some stuff. I'm about to get my life together. I'm tired of hitting and missing. Up one day, down the next day. The devil is a liar. I'm tired of having faith one day, doubting the next day. I'm about to get in the rhythm of consistency. It's going to show up in my life, and I'm going to make some moves. Where are my move makers in God's house? I'm about to make some moves, baby. Because there's certain things that God wants to do in your life that necessitate the velocity of consistency. God is building you. He's building you. I'm about to get it together. Some of you, I feel it prophetically. You were so close, but your inconsistency robbed you of what God had for you. But I'm here to tell you, it's coming back around. God is about to do something on the inside of you, and when it shows up this time, you are not going to miss it. You're not going to miss it. Because Marabosha, he's developing, Marabashi Maraba, he's developing consistency in you. Hallelujah. Uh huh. You, you've been praying for consistency. Well, I believe by the Spirit of God, consistency is showing up right now. Maybe that's the harvest that Pastor Dobbins was talking about. Maybe the harvest is you. Maybe the harvest is a better you. Maybe the harvest is a more consistent you. Come on, somebody. God, don't give me stuff. Give me me. Because if you give me me, I'll birth some stuff in Jesus' name. Consistency. Uh-huh. Check it out. God says, we love this verse. God says in Jeremiah 29 and 11, he says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Watch this. Plans to prosper you. Did you catch it? We think that that verse, Pastor Cora, means that God wants to bring things into our life. That's not what that verse says. He says, I want to prosper you because if I prosper you, you will prosper. 
I want to prosper you. I want to make you what I saw. That's why I'm the potter, potter's house. I'm the potter. I got a vision in my mind. So I put you on my hands and I begin to shape you and I begin to make you and I begin to mold you. And sometimes it makes you dizzy and sometimes you get disoriented. But let me tell you, when I get finished with you, you are gonna look like everything I saw. I hear the Lord saying, just let me work. I hear God saying, just let me work. Because all things are going to work together for your good. If you love me and you are called according to my purpose, just let me work. Just let me work. Just let me work. Just let me work. Can we go further? This, if you're taking notes, write this down. Consistency, this consistency that I'm talking about is a rhythm of being that brings us into a state, watch this, a state of continuous birthing. That's what the text is talking about. For he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in every season whose that brings forth its fruit in every season, that brings forth its fruit in every season, that brings forth its fruit in every season. No season is stale. No season is barren. Some of you are getting ready to step into a season where everything is going to, I feel God, everything is going to work all of a sudden. Bullseye, bullseye, bullseye. I feel it. See, family, we know about the seasons of perpetual tribulation. We've all been there before. Feel the Holy Ghost. We've all been there before where, man, it just seems like we are troubled on every side. Anybody ever been there before? You, you barely up from the last thing and something new shows up. We all are well familiar with that, and obviously sometimes we need that to get developed. Oh, but there's another season. It's what the Bible talks about in Deuteronomy chapter 28, when God comes upon you and overtakes you with blessing. Are you tracking with me? That happens in the state of consistency. New season. I, I've, 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 I've found myself in seasons where the blessings were so abundant in my life, I got scared. I got scared. Sometimes you're waiting for the other shoe to drop, but it doesn't. Another blessing drops instead. That's what he's talking about. In Psalm 1 and 3, consistency is a rhythm of being that brings us into a state of continuous birthing, producing, and manifesting. If you're taking notes, write this down. Sometimes the difference between a dream and its reality is your consistency. Your consistency. God oftentimes gives us dreams and vision while we are still in production. And that's why it feels so far away. Watch this. Because it feels like this is a type of life for another person. And to a certain degree, it is. Because you ain't met you yet. And you're becoming. And sometimes... If we're not careful, we'll disqualify what God said because it is a life that looks so foreign from what I've experienced, from what mama experienced, from what daddy experienced, and we will say, oh, no, 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 that can't be mine. No, he's talking to you. You are going to grow up into what he said. The word of God we oftentimes have to grow up into. It's not that it's wrong. 
It's not that it's for somebody else. It's not that you missed it somewhere. No, you're growing up into it. Can we keep going? Now, as it relates to getting to this state of consistency, I'm going to be honest with you, you got to go through some stuff to get there. You, you, you're going to have to, watch this, you're going to have to sort through some things, and you're going to have to first navigate some distractions in order to get there. There are stages of maturation. Three stages of maturation are first, clarity. I got to get clear. I'm not seeing right. I'm not seeing myself right. Clarity. Then there's consistency. And then you come to this place of continuous realization. So let's talk about the clarity phase real quick. Can I teach you a little bit this morning? So let's take a look at, at, at Psalm 1 and 1. I love this. is my favorite it might be one of my favorite, it may be my favorite passage of scripture in the Bible, but I could probably say it about all of it because it's, it's just so good to me. But look at what it says. So, so he starts off in verse one, he's talking about the blessed man, right? And I don't think that there was anybody more qualified to understand the blessing of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God, no one more than David. But it's interesting how he starts off this song about what it takes to be a blessed man. It says, blessed is the man, and then he goes into this entry. He says, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Okay, 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 that, that's kind of interesting to me because you would think that if he is going to give a dissertation about a blessed man, he's going to talk about what a blessed man is first. But he doesn't do that. He starts off by talking about what a blessed man is not. And here is what I have learned about blessed people. If you're taking notes, write this down. The blessed man, blessed people, always start out of position. <laughs> I feel like preaching. The blessed person always begins out of place. That, that, that's why when God is calling Abraham and he's telling him that he's getting ready to bless him, and make his name great and that he's going to be a blessing, what does he do? He says, I'm going to need you to get out your father's house and out of your country to a land that I will show you. I don't know why it's that way, but it is what it is. And this is important for you to know because sometimes you will think that you're cursed because of circumstance when you are most blessed. I feel the Holy Ghost. No, 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 no. The reason why he starts off by telling us what the blessed man is not is because blessed people always start out of place. Are you tracking with me? He says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. All these things he has to undo. And one of the things that I've learned about Becoming in God is in order to become in God, you first have to unbecome. <laughs> oh, I wish I had about four hours with you today. We understand becoming, we don't understand unbecoming. In order to walk into who I am, I have to walk out of who I am not. Oh, it's true. It's true. Uh, he, this, the blessed man, he, he has to navigate who he is not. Oh, I feel like digging in there for a minute. I, 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 as a man thinks, so is he. And you can only think on the level of your exposure. Most of the time, the people that you grew up with most of the time don't really know who you are because 
They're basing your identity on their experience with you at a certain point. And that is why when you begin to walk with God, you no longer connect with some people because they don't recognize you anymore because you're changing. Y'all used to fit like a glove. And now it's like the O.J. Simpson trial. If the glove don't fit. And here is the thing, family. You need to hear me loud and clearly. I don't know who I'm talking to today. It's okay. You're not better than anybody else. They're not better than you. This is about identity, baby. This is about destiny, baby. I'm not going to be unequally yoked because I'm going somewhere. I'm on a time clock, baby. I'm going somewhere. Can we dance together? Do we have the same rhythm? If we don't, I got to go. Because life is about rhythm. Everything is about rhythm. I can't dance with you if you don't know my dance. And my dance today is not my dance from 10 years ago. Yeah, we used to tear the club up. I don't do that no more. I got to work through who I'm not. That's why Paul, hey, Marashi. When Paul first gets saved, you'll find this in Galatians, the first chapter. When Paul first gets saved, he withdraws from his religious community. He withdraws, he goes into the wilderness to be with God for three years. Why? Because I don't know who I am. And if I stay around things that connect with who I used to be, the harder it's going to be to find me. And he comes out of that season so powerful and so clear, watch this, and so full of revelation, which was counterculture to the time. Man, I don't know who I'm talking to right now. I feel the Holy Spirit just doing work, just doing work, just doing work, just doing work. Yeah, unbecoming is just as important as becoming because my life right now is being produced by what's in my head. And that's why Paul said transformation, watch this, transformation is not even about getting saved. That's the transformation of your soul, but the transformation of your mind is a different thing. He says, let us not be conformed to this world, but let us be transformed, how? By the this is post-salvation, family. Post-salvation. By the renewing of my mind. Why? Because my mind defines my identity. There's some things that you think about you that are not true. And there are some things that have been projected onto you that are not true. My, my bishop would put it this way. I didn't know I was me. And so unbecoming, I've got to move through this. So, so unbecoming, unbecoming is just as important as becoming. In fact, you have to unbecome in order to become. That's why the writer is starting with unbecoming. That's why he's doing it. Let me just tell you something right now. It takes time to become you. That, that, it, it, it can take a lifetime for you to become you. It, it's not overnight. That's why you can't get weary in your well-doing. I recently let my beard grow out with the gray and everything. I 
I celebrate Jesus for gray hair. I'm, I'm telling you, because let me tell you something. With this gray hair, I make less mistakes and have more money because of this gray hair. Hello, somebody. Less mistakes and more money. Don't be tripping about your hair or, or your body or all this kind of stuff. And I, look, I'm not mad at anybody. You die, you know, like, that's just one. How, whatever makes you feel good. But don't do it because you don't think that there's value in age. The devil is a liar. I wouldn't go back to 25 if you paid me. You couldn't pay me. Because what I would gain in youth, I would lose in wisdom. And I've learned that wisdom is the principle. And I hear God telling somebody that thinks they're past their time, you are not past your time. You are in your prime time, baby. Your whole life has prepared you for this moment. Where are my seniors in God's house? Holla at you, boy. Celebrate those gray hairs. Come on, somebody. You ain't got to pluck them out. What are you running from? If God still has breath in your body, use it to his glory. Mm -hmm. That's why the Bible says that your ladder shall be greater than your former. Let me remix that. That your older will be greater than your younger. Uh-huh. We doing all kind of stuff, praise God. Whatever makes you happy. Celebrate that. Because becoming you takes time. And the majority of the time spent, Dr. Jill, the majority of the time spent is finding out who you're not. That's 50 years right there. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. That was interesting. I want you to see a progression that you may have missed. Watch this. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands. I want you to see a progression. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the, of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scorn. Did you see it? Did you see it? When I don't know who I am, I go from walking to standing. And then the next thing you know, I'm sitting on the side of the road as a scorner, hating on this person, hating on that person, on the side of the road when I'm supposed to be up, walking in my purpose, walking in my calling, walking in my identity, walking in my destiny. I hear God say, you better get up and keep on walking. When I'm connected to the wrong voice, I will walk a path that will ultimately have me sitting. Now is not a time to sit, baby. I'm on the move. I've got stuff to do, places to go, ministries to build, businesses to build, a generation to raise. Holla at me if you're a world changer like me. When you don't know who you are, 
because you haven't gone through the process of unbecoming, you will find yourself on the side of the road, begging, scornful, a scorner ain't nothing but a hater. That's all a scorner is. Haters are not bad people. They're not bad people. I, I learned that. Haters are just people who don't believe that God can do it for them. Because they never became. They never got out of the unbecoming process. I got to keep going here this morning. I heard God say, just keep walking. I hear God saying to somebody, it's time to get moving again. Because here is the thing, family, I don't care where you've been, what you've gone through, how low or how high you are, God has things that he needs you to walk into. That's why you are hearing this message. He is not finished with you. If he were finished with you, you would not be here. The only reason why God has breath in your body is because God has not seen what he said concerning your life. I need you to keep on walking. Keep walking. Keep swinging at it. Now I'm going to tell you, in order to walk into, you got to be willing to walk out of. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. We want to walk into God. I want to walk into your promises. But God, I'm struggling with walking out of what I've been familiar with for so long. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I, I, I want to walk in. I, I want to walk into what you promised me. But I'm having a difficult time walking out of my comfort zone. And I'll tell you right now that comfort and destiny are mutually exclusive. Did you catch what I just said? Comfort and destiny do not live in the same house. You're going to have to make up your mind. Am I going to be everything that God has called me to be? Or am I going to find comfort in discomfort? It's normal. Discomfort is normal. Think about all discomfort is, is you're just unfamiliar. Because we're comfortable. Watch this. It's amazing. We pray for change, but don't want change. Yeah, we, we pray for change, but do not want to change. So our being, our disposition is working against our prayer. I'm praying for change, but won't take a step out of my comfort. What if the change that you're praying for is over there? And we're like, no, God, bring change to me. And he's saying, I can't do that. That doesn't make sense. I put change over there. Will you take a step of faith and step into where change is? I'm trying to move on. Mm-hmm. How bad do you want it? In order to walk into, you got to be willing to walk out of in order to walk into, you have to learn how to, how to get back up after a fall, after a failure, after a disappointment, with the same bounce back and pep in your step that you had before you started. You know, I, in life, things are going to happen to you. You're going to be disappointed. And, and truthfully, disappointment is not God's fault. Disappointment is the byproduct of an ignorant expectation. I expected something legitimately and in earnest. I did. But I was ignorant to the reality of what would happen. So I expected that expectation was not met and I was disappointed. But I can't have disappointment without ignorance. 
which means that, and, and we're not God, we're not omniscient, which means that in life we're going to be disappointed. But whatever you do, and this is for some, somebody, I'm going to move on. Whatever you do, don't let disappointment rob you of the gift of faith. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody. Don't let disappointment make you never do it again. Don't, don't make disappointment keep you from being a risk taker. Oh, God. Don't lick your wounds. Take a minute. If you got to have a few words with God, have a few words with God. Get it out your system and then get right back in the fight with the same expectation that you had when you got into the fight in the first place. Are you tracking with me? Because the enemy has a narrative in your disappointment. See, you shouldn't have done that in the first place. Let me tell you something. Even if it doesn't work out, there is value in exercising your faith muscle. Because one day, it will show up. And may it never be said about us that when the real thing came up, it passed us by because we were seated, because we were disappointed about something that was Ishmael and not Isaac. Let's go further. Let's go further. The Bible says in, in Proverbs chapter 24 and 16, it says that a, that a righteous man may fall seven times, and yet he does what? Rises up again. You know why? It says that a righteous man may fall seven times and yet rise up again. It's because a righteous man has an understanding that even my failure is working for my good. And if I allow my failure to keep me down, I'm going to miss what God really had. Never underestimate a man who won't stop walking. Never underestimate a person who will not quit. We got to keep going. So that first stage is, a, is the clarity stage. It's, it's where I figure out who I'm not, and, and then I begin to understand who I am. The next phase is a phase that is the consistency phase, and it's in Psalm 1 and 2. So Psalm 1 and 2 reads, after we've worked out who we're not, it says, but... His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, he meditates day and night. Did you see it? He got into a rhythm. He, 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 he got out of that process that was taking, that negative rhythm, that, that false rhythm, because he wasn't listening to the right voices. And all of a sudden now, he finds this, this new rhythm. And, and, and it says, interestingly enough, it says his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So now the mind is introduced. The mind is introduced. If you're taking notes, write this down. The rhythm of consistency is developed first in the mind. In the mind. I can't be beyond what I think. There is no way around it. If these words do not change the way you think, you will stay in the previous rhythm. It is just the way it works. I got to change the way I think. I, I this, 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 this consistency is about what you consistently fix your mind on. I feel the Holy Ghost. I, uh, I personally, I'm committed to nothing short of quality thoughts. I feel the Holy Ghost. 
You get this, this will change your life. Family, I, I, I am committed, I swear to you, I will not allow an unprofitable thought to stay in my mind longer than a split second. If you are going to do destiny, you must be committed to the real estate of your mind. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jealousy is not a quality thought. Hate is not a quality thought. Watch this. Doubt is not a quality thought. Insecurity is not a quality thought. Fear is not a quality thought. I have to take inventory and ownership over this thing. My pastor can't do it. My wife can't do it. My kids can't do it. Not even God can do it. I've got to say, this is my mind and it's going to work for me and not against me in Jesus' name. If you know what I'm talking about, holler at me. I'm in control of this thing. My mind's supposed to serve me. Devil, you are a liar. And that's what Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians. When he said the weapons, watch this. He says the weapons of our warfare, they ain't carnal. He said, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, you think that when he's talking about strongholds, he's talking about a demon. That is not what he is talking about. A stronghold is a fortified argument. It is something that the enemy has caused you to believe and you have believed it for so long, you think it's your thought. But Paul says there is power in the name of Jesus to break every negative thought so that you can be everything that God has created you to be. I will not tolerate an anti-me thought. I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, no, devil. I don't receive that. I am enough. I am good enough. I am special. I am blessed. I am anointed. I am purposed. I am healed. I am well. I am whole. Uh huh. If he's the great I am and I'm made in his image, I better get some of that too. You got to be committed, family, to quality thoughts. I got a thought cop in my head. And he's checking every thought. In the garden, they were hiding from God. They said, we hid because we were naked. God said, who told you that? Where did you get? the alternative narrative from because it didn't come from me I said you're beautiful I said you're naked and you don't have to be ashamed who lied to you about you I'm committed to quality thoughts about me and about other people here's just something to run alongside in relationships in life, you will have to do relationships. It is always better to think the highest thought about somebody else than the lowest. It is better to assume that they were not being rude. Hello, somebody. Watch this. It is better to assume, in some cases, that they're not racist than to accuse them and be wrong. Uh huh. Sometimes, for your own sake, 
They could be, and God will deal with it. But for your own sake, know nobody according to the flesh. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, I am he who blots out your transgressions. And for my own sake, I will remember your sin no more. What got me there, I get the blotting out, I get, that's wonderful. But what got me is God said, for my own sake, I will not remember that. I, I will not think I blot for my own. In other words, in order for me to stay pure, I don't care how unpure you are, in order for me to stay pure, I'm gonna just believe the best about you. Now, I might not fool with you, because I'm not a fool. But I would rather believe that if you don't have it together today, maybe you might meet Jesus and have it together the next day. For me, I love the whiz. There's a part in the whiz where there was the witch and she had this song, Don't Nobody Bring Me. Don't Nobody Bring Me. No bad news. And she had all the dancers that would chime in. No bad news. No bad news. They got it. If you haven't watched the whiz, go watch it. It's amazing. But I loved her philosophy. Don't, don't, you gotta tell your mind sometimes. Don't bring me no bad news about me. For God knows the plans that he has for me. They are good and not evil. Plans to prosper me. And that's why sometimes I love everybody, but sometimes I can't be around people that are always bringing me bad news. Don't nobody bring me no bad news. Bad news does not help me. Bad news, the Bible, the gospel literally means good news. Why are you bringing me an anti-gospel? Don't nobody bring me no bad news. And you got to tell your head that. Can I go further? Consistency has to do with the quality of your thoughts. There's a passage of scripture that I love. See, I told you I can say that about every passage. It's in, it's in, 1 Peter 1.13, and I love it. It says, <laughs> Peter is saying, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. That word gird up phrase that was translated gird up literally means to bind up, right? To bind up or to be tight. So your mind can't be loosey-goosey. You cannot just be a drifter. You have to be intentional with your tool. You, you gotta be, you can't just let your mind do whatever. Gird up, gird up, gird up, gird. It has to be tight, so tight that it doesn't have room for foolishness. Tight mind, that's why, look, I love entertainment, but, but sometimes there's stuff I can't, I can't, I, uh, uh, I can't do that. I can't, I can't do that because of, because of what's getting in my mind when I watch it. And it seems like entertainment, and it seems like it's cute and it's cool, but it's messing with me. That word literally means bind up. So I have to, my mind, I have to gird up the loins of my mind. That word gird up again means to bind. My mind has to be tight. It has to be tight. That word loins is a Greek word, and it's the Greek word osphis, and it literally means, it has the idea in it of procreative power. So gird up the loins of your mind. I have to keep my mind tight. Watch this, because my mind has procreative power. Power. 
and I have to protect it, procreate it, power. What's the difference between to procreate and to create? To procreate is to reproduce. So my mind will reproduce out of it what it is. It has reproductive power. That's why God gives you a word, and when God has given you a word, God has given you a vision. Because he wants you to take that vision and reproduce it into the natural realm. Hey. Are we tracking? And so I gotta keep my mind tight, and I have to be committed to quality thoughts because I produce, watch this, if you're taking notes, write this down. I produce my life out of my head. Hello, somebody. Your life and my life is produced out of this thing. It is not produced out of my hands because my hands only respond to what my head says. My life is produced out of my, I'm committed, I'm committed to quality thoughts. So God jumps in there because how do we get to quality thoughts? God jumps in there and he says, look, I got you. Let me help you with that. I want to give you access to my mind. I want to give you access to my mind. It says, but in his law, he meditates day and night. That word law is a Hebrew word. It's a Hebrew word, Torah, and it literally means, watch this, law, direction, or instruction. And it, the root word of that is yara, which means to flow as water. So basically what that passage is saying is that he meditates, watch this, on my flow. He meditates in my flow. I feel God. He, he, the blessed man who is going to be so consistent that he produces fruit in every season and his leaf doesn't wither is the one, watch this, who learns how to catch my flow and meditate in my flow. I feel the Holy Ghost. There's a flow, there's a rhythm, there's, there's a rhythm, there's a rhythm. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, the Bible says that, that something came in the room. Some people miss over it and they think that a wind came in the room. A wind did not come into the room. A sound came into the room as a rushing and mighty wind. A sound, a rhythm, a flow. A flow. Watch this. Watch this. Watch it. A flow came into the room. And it says when the flow, when the sound, when the rhythm came into the room, it says then there appeared to them. So this sound brought revelation. Oh, I'm going to help about 14 people this morning. There, there, there is a flow. Watch this. So, 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 a sound comes in, a rhythm comes in, a flow comes in. When the flow comes in, it says that cloven tongues of fire appeared to them. Divided tongues appeared, okay? When the divided tongues appear, then they begin to do in the natural, what they saw in the spiritual, and they begin to speak with other tongues because they caught the rhythm of God. They caught the flow of God, and the flow of God got them to move into position, and they started prospering. Somebody's going to catch, I feel God. Somebody's going to catch the flow. You, you're going to catch the flow. You, you came to church, but you're about to catch the flow. And the flow is going to change your life. See, here is the thing about consistency. There is always a flow. Even when you're sad, there's a flow. Even when your back is against the wall, there's a flow. Even when there's difficulty in your marriage, there is a flow. Even when there's difficulty in your money, there is a flow. And you got to be committed to the flow. How did this guy, I'm almost done. How did this guy go from being out of place and then in to position and alignment so wonderfully, watch this, that he began to tap into heaven's consistency. 
See, Psalm 1 and 3 is about heaven's consistency. For he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in every season whose leaf will not wither and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Look at the language and the imagery there. That is something that is not broken. Oh God, I feel it. See, the reason why God wants us to be consistent is because he is. His word is settled in heaven. What God has spoken over you and over your family is settled in heaven. And the only thing that can keep us from the consistency of what God decreed is our inconsistency. How did he do it? He locked into God's voice. The voice of the Lord is the only thing that knows who you are, who God is, and where you are going. The reason why the blessed man in the beginning, through listening to the counsel or the voice or the instruction of the ungodly, ended up sitting down is because he was connected to the wrong voice. Feel the Holy Ghost. Some of you, some of you, God is getting ready to introduce you to his voice unlike ever before. For some of you, for others, he is going to reintroduce you to his voice because I sense that you haven't been relying on the voice of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. It's the mind of Christ. Eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man those things that God has prepared for those who love him. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But verse 10 says, but he has revealed them to us through his spirit. For his spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. I feel like some in this room, you're going to get reacquainted with the voice of the Lord. Hallelujah. And... Some of you, I feel this prophetically, you, you, you have been detached. You've been estranged from the voice of the Lord. And you're getting ready to return. And this time when you return to the voice of the Lord, you're going to do it with a level of commitment that's going to bring a consistency to your life. I feel God. And I heard the word restoration and acceleration. That's going to be your portion. Restoration and acceleration. The last thing that I will, I'll point out in that, and I think this is important, is when it talks about fruit, you're going to bear fruit in every season. What jumped out at me was legacy. Legacy. And it is highly important as you look at your life and you think you consider the phases unbecoming and becoming and Becoming consistent and becoming continuously producing. You got a lot of stuff to birth. But one thing that I want you to start thinking about if you haven't started thinking now is legacy. God wants you not only to bear fruit, but he wants you to bear fruit that remains. You and I have got to get to this consistent place because there are generations on the inside of us. I'm already looking at the next generation. I'm already thinking about who I'm passing my baton to, how many people I'm passing it to. You got to think about that stuff now. It's about legacy. I want to pray for you. God spoke to me so clearly. Just keep walking. That's all you got to do. Keep walking. There's still more for you to see. If you don't walk, he can't show you told Abraham, get out of your father's house and to a land that I will show you. A land that I will show you. Keep walking. What made you stop walking? And when did you stop walking? And what have you missed? But if you're hearing this message, it's because God's not finished with you. Come on, stand with me real quick. Don't leave. Stand. I want to pray. I want to pray for you. See, I didn't come... 
to simply teach. I came to impart something. Because God's going to shift some rhythms. He's going to shift some rhythms. And some of you have been clogged. You've been clogged up until now. And God is getting ready to unclog you. If you're here and you feel like the Lord was speaking to you loud and clear and you know it, and you want the strength to be consistent and to just keep walking, I want you to come meet me at this altar really quickly. I want to pray for you. You know God was speaking to you. Just come meet me down here right now. We're going to pray. You're going to be consistent. You're not going to be all over the place. You're not going to believe in yourself one day and not believe in yourself the next day. A, a new rhythm is coming to you. A new rhythm is got new flow is coming to you. And you will be like a tree. It's going to be crazy. What Psalm 1 and 3 describes is the Midas touch. A Holy Ghost version of the Midas touch. That's not in there to excite you and pump you up. That's true. This is God's vision for your life. He wants you to be aligned with him in such a way that all you do is win. Even when you lose, you're still winning. And you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf will not wither and whatever you do shall prosper. And here's one thing I want to say to you too. Sometimes planting, sometimes being planted does not resemble progress. Very important. Very important. Sometimes being planted doesn't resemble progress. When you think about a tree, everything that causes the tree to produce outside is happening inside. Some of you are getting ready to bear fruit and you have been discouraged because you haven't seen an outer and you have been discounting what God has been doing in you what he's been doing in you. And typically, when God is doing something in you, it's hurtful. It's hurtful, but you're still here. I went through it, but I'm still here. Don't you think for a second that that pain was not developing something on the inside of you. There is no, God doesn't waste nothing. He doesn't waste one tear, not one tear, not one sleepless night, not one heartache, not one heartbreak. He doesn't waste one thing. You're planted. If you study what makes a tree work and how a tree grows, it is not from the outside. It's from within. It's a whole ecosystem to, it, to itself. And everything that makes it work outside is happening on the inside in a place that you can't see. And then the seasons come and boom, you didn't thought you thought the tree was dead. No, it just wasn't the season for that fruit. It was very much alive. I feel God. I hear God saying, your vision, your dream is very much alive. It's alive. Very much so. It's in you. You just have to believe it consistently. You have to get to a place where you say, I don't even trust my eyes. I trust what you said more than what I see. And if I got to just close my eyes and imagine your word until I see it in my life, that's what I'm going to do. Because it's going to happen but it takes time it doesn't take God time it takes us time to become it takes time to become you I said it earlier I'm gonna say it again you're not past your time 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 you're right on schedule and even though you're becoming, in the midst of you becoming, 
even right now, you're still enough. God, God does not hold back his affirmation until you get to heaven. God says in this moment, my beloved son, my beloved daughter, I am well pleased. Jesus hadn't done one miracle when the father said that to him. He hadn't done one thing yet. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I see you. I see all of you. I see what you struggle with. I see your unbelief at times. I see what attempts to bind you and keep you. I see your cycles. I see your rhythms. But I'm telling you right now, I also see what I formed. I see what I formed. And I'm proud of you. And I got you. Because when I see you, watch this. I don't see who you think you are. That ain't what I see. Because I see in truth. I see what I made. And I'm rejoicing over what I see. I hear God saying, because I've got faith in what I put in you. I got faith in what I put in you. And if I've got faith in what I put in you, it's time for you to believe in what God has placed on the inside of you. And that at the appointed time and at the proper time, that tree is going to sprout up. Father, I thank you for every son and daughter under the sound of your voice. Those who are watching via live stream right now, those who are here in your house, you've spoken to us, God. You've told us that all we got to do is just keep walking. All we've got to do is just keep walking and we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Father, I believe that there were some in this room who were weary in their well-doing. But I thank you, Lord God, that they came to church today. That they came to your house today. And God, you told them all oh, but due season is coming. It is not overdue. It's right on time. Now, Father, I pray. First of all, I thank you that there is a sound in my Shiva la. There's a rhythm that has our identity in it, that knows who we truly are, that knows who you are, and that knows the plans that you have for us. There is a, a voice that only speaks truth that says, this is the way, walk in it. A voice that will guide us all the days of our lives and afterwards receive us in the glory and there's some God that need to be reconnected to that voice so Holy Spirit I pray God that you would make yourself known in a fresh way to your sons and daughters and that they would in no way walk in the counsel of the ungodly nor stand in the path of those who don't get it nor sit in the seat of the scornful but God that you would put a new hunger, a new thirst, hey, a new delight in our spirit for your voice unlike never before. And God, we bless you that when we do, and we do it day and night, and we do it consistently, we are trees planted by the rivers of water, and we are gonna bring forth fruit in every season of our lives, and our leaf will not wither and whatever we do will prosper if you believe that make some noise unto god yeah yeah that's your portion 